Welcome to Hail Varsity Radio, the voice of Husker Nation. Insight, opinion, expertise, with the biggest and best names talking Nebraska across the state. Join the show on Twitter at Hail Varsity and at Schmitz underscore radio. Call in at 402-466-ESPN or 1-800-825-5865. Here's Chris Schmitz. Happy Friday. It's Hail Varsity Radio presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Not Chris Schmidt today. Chris out watching his son play some baseball. Sounds like they're doing pretty well in the tournament. Uh, at the last check that I got. A hot day for some baseball. Let me tell you what. <laughs> Just brutal. It's going to be even worse tomorrow. I'm, I'm not looking forward to going out and umpiring high school baseball this weekend. It's going to be ugh. It's going to be ugh. But Elijah Herbal sitting in for Chris Schmidt today alongside Damon Barr. If you want to connect with the show today, you can find us and follow us on Twitter. That's Herbal Essences for me, for Damon Barr. It's at Damon Barr. And remember, Barr is spelled with two R's. You don't want to forget that. You can also follow at ESPN Lincoln. That's where you can find all the segments of uh, the interviews that we're going to be having today, as well as at Hale Varsity for uh, Hale Varsity Magazine. All the written stuff will be posted on Hale Varsity's Twitter page. That's a great page to follow. You can also call the show, 402-466-3776. Damon working the phones hard today. He's uh, going to be fielding all your calls, and he is ready for them. Uh, I saw the man. I don't think he drank a Red Bull, but he just looks prepared in there. Uh, you can also call 1-800-825-5865. I didn't have the sheet in front of me. I just about forgot the phone number, but it came back. It came back. Not off to the uh, the hottest start today. Uh, but Damon, how are you doing today? Uh, I'm doing great. Uh, just uh, had a nice week this week. I'm ready to enjoy a weekend and then uh, start wearing a mask next week. Yeah, speaking of that, uh, Mayor Leary and Gaylord Bear here in Lincoln, just within the past uh, about 45 minutes, issued a new mask mandate for the city of Lincoln. If you are living in Lincoln beginning Monday, when you enter any public building or uh, business, you're going to be required to wear a mask. There are a few exceptions. I know uh, restaurants, once you're seated at your table, you're allowed to take the mask off. Uh, me here broadcasting or if you're speaking to a group of people you're allowed to take the mask off but other than that a mask mandate in Lincoln Uh, I I experienced it when I went out to Colorado about two months ago and it's not all that bad I experienced the same in Chicago and it's just you just put it on it's I mean most of your days it's not like you're spending most of your day in your mask you're you're, you're keeping a mask in your car and you're putting it on for five minutes when you go walk into Walmart you know or Target if you're a Target person Hy-Vee I shouldn't discriminate so many great shopping options that you can choose from. I don't want to judge you based on where you shop at. They're all great for their own separate reasons. And I support you with whichever grocery store you do choose. Uh, But as long as you're wearing a mask, I guess I should say, that's the one stipulation beginning Monday mask law in effect in Lincoln. And that runs through August 31st. So uh, Lincoln, I believe the quote that, uh, that mayor Gaylord Baird had was that she didn't want Lincoln to be the next uh, Miami or Houston or any of the cities that have been infected badly. So whether or not you like the masks, it's not going to matter here starting Monday. You're going to have to wear it. And hopefully, hopefully it ensures that we can get some Husker football in the fall. Speaking of Husker football, the big news from today is that the second defensive back from the class of 2020, uh, Jaden Francois, is now joining Henry Gray and entering the transfer portal. Henry Gray uh, actually committed to Florida International. We'll see if Jaden Francois is following suit. I know the two were friends. Uh, But Jaden, now the 15th scholarship player to leave Nebraska this offseason. It's high. It's, it's a high amount. 15. One of those ones that make you go, really? I kind of look back through all the guys that I've left and go, is that really added up to 15? But also not completely unexpected. I mean, I think we talked about it on this show right when the season ended. Uh, as we were talking with, couldn't tell you who the interview was. That was now seven months ago. Way, way too long for my memory. Uh, but that was, that was the talk was we're expecting guys are going to be hitting the road. We're going to be bringing in new talent, new younger guys to fill the spaces of these guys who are leaving. But I don't think we're expecting to see two guys in the class of 2020, especially both of them defensive backs, uh, to be leaving the class already. But at the same time, that could speak for the competition in the room. I know Travis Fisher was on Sports Nightly on Thursday night, and he actually didn't men- mention Jaden Francois once during that interview. Could have been a sign of things to come. Uh, but he still said he was excited for the competition this fall. He says the younger guys are not afraid of the older guys, and the old, older guys aren't scared of competing with these younger guys. Uh, a couple names he mentioned, uh, Lynam was one of the names that he mentioned, uh, as well as the, the classic starters that you always have, Cam Taylor Britt, DiCaprio Boodle. Uh, is it Deontay Williams? Yeah, yeah, Deontay Williams. Uh, so 
it's one of those things where I'm obviously disappointed to see talent leaving Nebraska, especially one of Jaden Francois's quality and ability. He's a four-star defensive back from down in Miami. Um, Travis Fisher actually flipped him from the Canes. He was committed to uh, Miami at two separate points where he committed to him, decommitted, committed again. A total of one year was spent committed to Miami, and then he flips to Nebraska. And if you remember, he had that signing day drama where he was sitting in his high school gymnasium and about to make a decision, then he gets a call, and he, he leaves the gym in tears. It, it was one of those just dramatic things he saw on Twitter. He went, what the hell is going on here? Um, and kind of later, rumors indicate that there was some uh, negative recruiting going on from other schools saying, Travis Fisher is about to jump ship and head to Ole Miss. Scott Frost kind of rebuked those rumors pretty quickly, and Travis Fisher got a new deal out of it. Uh, so it kind of worked out for Travis Fisher. Uh, but I guess hasn't worked out for Jaden Francois. He's going to be hitting the road. Interesting to see where he's going to go next, whether he follows his friend Henry Gray down to FIU. Uh, I know Miami committed there twice. He had a, a load of big offers, including Ohio State. Uh, Auburn, I believe, uh, had offered him as well, including Miami. So disappointing to say the least but we're going to chat about Jaden Francois a little bit more whenever we track down Greg Smith Greg Smith coming up here in about 15 minutes going to talk some recruiting with him as well Nebraska got that walk on from Jaquez Yant uh, this uh, week I believe is Wednesday and there was kind of confusion whether or not it was a preferred walk on or whether there was uh, an actual scholarship offer sounds like it was a preferred walk on but excited to talk with Greg a little bit about what position he's going to be uh, playing here at Nebraska and then maybe commitment watch on uh, the docket this weekend as Marquez Buford's making a decision. We'll talk with Greg about that. Also coming up next hour, we have Bill Dolman as well as a former producer for this show. You remember him uh, leaving last October was the last you would have heard of him. That's Colton Stone. We're going to get caught up with him. Uh, I mean, he's had his chances to host this show as well. I'm sure you recognize him. You recognize his voice if you don't recognize the name already. Colton Stone joining us in hour two. Excited to talk to him. But before we can get to all of the rest of that good stuff in the show, I want to talk a little bit more about COVID and college football. You might be a little bit burnt out of the talk by now, but there was an important uh, release from the NCAA last night as they released their health and safety measures for the upcoming college football season. Uh, Nicole Auerbach had a pretty great write-up in The Athletic. She was the one who also broke the news on The Athletic last week that the Big Ten would be going to the 10-game conference-only schedule. She released her little write-up on the health and safety measures of uh, the NCAA this year. A couple interesting notes in there. The first being that a positive COVID test will lead uh, to a 10-day self-quarantine, which is kind of following suit with what we've heard across other sports, the MLB, the NBA, uh, even the NHL starting up. So that's not all that surprising. There's also going to be weekly in-season testing, And those tests must be administered within 72 hours of competition, excuse me. So that means either Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday, uh, these guys are going to be testing for COVID. And that's one of the big concerns that the NCAA had in this document was that the the testing turnaround time could throw a wrench into things. Just because if you're testing guys on Wednesday, they still got Thursday, Friday, even Saturday morning where they could contract COVID and then be spreading it in the game. So that's the biggest concern. And that's been the biggest concern for the MLB as well. Uh, About a month ago, there was a lot more hope on this testing front that with more developments, as we start going down in cases, which has kind of turned out to not be the case, but that was the hope was that as we go down in cases, we'll be able to get faster testing turnaround time, maybe within 12 hours. And now it's looking more like 72 hours is going to be the, the standard of what the turnaround time is going to be, especially to test a whole team, which isn't encouraging. Mark Emmer also had a statement uh, in conjunction with the health and safety measures uh, where he said, if there is going to be college athletics in the fall, we need a better handle on the pandemic, which obviously isn't encouraging for college athletics in the fall. Uh, An anonymous athletic director as a part of Nicole Auerbach's write-up said, and I quote, If tests and timely results become unattainable, then it all falls apart. So this this spike in cases, it's we've talked about on the show. It's serious. It's a big problem, especially when you look at the the. You got to have guys tested to be able to play. If you can't do that, you can't have football, and that's the biggest concern for the NCAA right now. If we do get to a point where we're playing football, which is obviously the goal, and it kind of looks like we're going in that direction, hopefully. Hopefully, it's going to be a weird season, but I think 
at the moment, I'd put money down that it's going to be at least a couple games in the fall, uh, even if it ultimately gets canceled. But there are circumstances listed in these health and safety measures that would indicate when a team can drop out and when maybe a whole conference uh, would be forced to drop out of the season. One of those is a lack of ability to isolate new positive cases or high contact risk uh, cases are on campus. So essentially, whenever they're spread on campus uh, is going to be the first reason that a team could cancel their season. The second would be unavailability or inability to perform symptomatic surveillance and pre-competition testing when warranted, which we got into. Uh, If you can't have the testing turnaround time, then that's a great reason to cancel your season because if you can't test your guys, you can't play football. The third, campus-wide or local community test rates are considered unsafe by local public health officials uh, to a point where a local health official or someone like the uh, the governor of Nebraska could say we're not going to be playing college football in Nebraska this fall, and that would be an acceptable reason for a team to cancel their season. The last two uh, are kind of the most important uh, in terms of if there isn't a directive from above of we need to cancel the season. That's inability to perform adequate contact tracing consistent with governmental requirements or recommendations. So if they're spread within a team and you can't trace where the spread is coming from, if you can't find the uh, the initial person who got it or you can't figure out who, in a sense, who got it from who. That's the best way to put it. If you can't figure out who got it from who within a team, then you are going to be looking at canceling another season. And the last is local public health officials stating that there is an inability for hospital infrastructure to accommodate a surge in hospital hospitalizations related to COVID-19. That doesn't look to be a problem here in Nebraska. I know uh, hospitalizations are pretty low uh, considering the amount of new cases we've had in Lincoln uh, this past week. But with other locations in the Big Ten and across the country, that could be an issue. And that is one that is, I think, going to be the most prevalent reason that a team cancels their season is, well, hospitalizations have gone up, cases have gone up, we can't have a season. So, so Damon, going to turn it over to you. All, all those seem to be pretty, I mean, expected. Seems reasonable. I, I, I think there's nothing, though, that was said that wasn't already assumed. Mm-hmm. Like, they're, they're saying if you have an outbreak, you won't be able to play okay. You wouldn't be able to play anyway if you had an outbreak on your team. You'd have too many players sitting out, things like that. I think it's really good that they're coming out with these guidelines, but they're still just guidelines at this point. Mm-hmm. And the NCAA is not stepping forward and making any rules. They're they're saying, all right, if this happens, you decide this. If the health officials decide this. So I think they're st- trying to kind of steer clear of forcing colleges and conferences to act in any particular way here with these guidelines. Yeah, I, I'm agreeing with you. I mean, the only real st- stipulation included uh, that is kind of a you have to do this is there has to be face coverings on the sideline among guys who are not playing so your coaches your training staff uh everyone like that on the sideline will be required to wear masks and face coverings and that's really the only direct directive that the colleges have to follow uh included in this at least health and safety measures still a long time before the season obviously but the main the main point when you take away from this was that the ncaa wasn't expecting cases to be this high at this moment I don't think they were expecting to have to put in these stipulations about, oh, these are the acceptable reasons for you to cancel your season. I think they were more expecting that here, face coverings, uh, we'll be able to do testing on Fridays before the games and stuff like that. They seem to be a little bit surprised by how many cases are still in the country. And I'm with them. I'm with them. I'm surprised, too. It's reaching a point where it's we, we thought we had it under control and now it's appears to be clearly not under control yet again. And if we can't get it under control, we can't have college football. That's what the NCAA is saying, and that's what I think we've been saying on this show for about the past two weeks. I think one another big indicator of if we're going to get a season is how these professional sports kind of start back up and continue to go. I know we can't do anything like the NBA's bubble or anything, but just seeing these live sports and how they work with testing and all these things, I think it'll give the NCAA a little more of a, a basis to, you know, do what they need to do and see a plan that's already maybe worked out or maybe hasn't worked out if it doesn't. What scares me at this point is we're about a week out, about a week from the start of this quote unquote mini camp that the college teams have been allowed to do this year. And we still just, aren't hearing answers we still don't know the NCA still doesn't know and that's really concerning to me is we were thinking I even remember saying back in April May that July is going to be the month where we're going to hear all the news and we've been hearing the news 
but none of it is anything set in stone still. It's still just, well, the conferences can decide, and here's some reasons you can cancel your season if you feel like you have to. It, it's still, just, nothing is, nothing set. And anxiety is one word I'd put on it surrounding the college football season. I'm nervous. I don't know what I'm going to do if there's no college football. Uh, not, not, not at all where I thought we would be at this point a week out from the college football or a month out from uh, the college football season, a week out from these mini camps starting. Just tough. Looks like we've run out of time to talk about uh, the bowl season. The executive director of the football bowl association, Nick uh, Caparelli had an interview uh, with the athletic where he discussed some bowl opportunities for the fall, essentially saying they're determined to make it work. We'll get into that a little bit later coming up though. After the break, we got recruiting recon with Greg Smith, excited to talk Jaden Francois, Henry Gray, Nabab Joseph, all coming up with Greg Smith. Also got Bill Dolman and Colton stone coming up in hour two. And to finish this hour, I think we're going to talk a little NHL, a little NBA, a little MLB, as those seasons are also all beginning to gear up. We're not sure what's coming with college football, but we do know that the three major pro sports are going to be starting up. So we'll kind of talk about what we're excited for uh, coming up in those seasons. It's Hale Varsity Radio presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Back with Greg Smith next. And we're back. Fellas, I think we could listen to the radio listen? On Hale Varsity Radio presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Yes! That's awesome. We're back in. It's Hill Varsity Radio presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Chris has the day off today out watching his son play some baseball. He will be back tomorrow. He's out at the golf course covering the Tyson's Treasure Chest Annual Golf Tournament. Uh, I will be board hopping. He's going to be doing that alongside Jeremiah Searles. Excited for that. If you're missing Chris today, he will be back in the morning for the Saturday morning edition. Excited now to welcome in recruiting insider for Hale Varsity Magazine. It's Greg Smith. Got a couple things to get into with Greg, but... Greg, before we get into all the, the news from today, just got to ask you, how you doing, man? I am doing well. I'm trying to stay cool. I'm like Chris, uh, who I'm sure is, is melting outside uh, watching his kid play ball. Any plans for grilling this weekend? Chris always asks you. I got to ask. <laughs> and, I, and you said you didn't do much grilling last weekend, but is it going to be too hot for grilling this weekend? Uh, it's funny. I was telling him uh, earlier today the effect that today is definitely too hot. Um, I'm not trying to get out there. I think I will try to do something this weekend. We got some new like grill pan things. I think I'm gonna throw some uh, shrimp in there and, and see how that goes. I'm, I'm excited to try that out. Oh, sounds good. That sounds good. I'm not a big shrimp guy. Well, what do you okay. like to put on it though? Um, usually just like some regular mix, like, some Old Bay seasoning, um, and then maybe a sauce at the end. Um, mm. But we'll see. It depends on how, how you're feeling. But just like just keep it simple with the shrimp idea. Keep it simple. Good to know. Well, Greg. Yeah. We got to get into the big news of today, and that's Jaden Francois in, er, announcing that he has entered his name into the transfer portal. He's now the second defensive back from the class of 2020. Both those guys from Florida, Henry Gray and Francois, now uh, leaving the Huskers. And I got to ask, are you surprised by this news? Um, I'm not totally surprised uh, just because Jaden was kind of – well, there's two reasons. One, he had kind of had a, a weird recruitment that was kind of back and forth. You remember um, his, everyone's kind of first exposure to him and his, his kind of odd recruitment was when he was making his decision um, and, and he was on the phone forever and he's trying to get in touch um, with coaches and like trying to figure out what he was going to do and kind of going back and forth. And everybody saw that scene play out on, I think, a weird live stream. Um, but then before that, if you remember, he had actually been committed to Miami twice and then obviously he committed from them twice before ultimately signing with Nebraska. So he did have some indecision uh, throughout the recruiting process. Then once he got to campus, he was an early enrollee um, and went through kind of winter conditioning. But then obviously once spring hit and there was only, what, one, maybe two practices, um, and then the response to the COVID-19 pandemic happened and everyone went home, when people came, when everyone, the players came back uh, for the voluntary workouts, he was probably, he was one of the last people, um, if not the last scholarship person to come back uh, to the football team, which usually tells you um, that there's some more indecision in there, and he's not quite sure what's going to happen. I think the only other scholarship player 
um, that did not return yet is Daniel Turney, the punter who's kind of stuck in Australia right now. So that's kind of a, a special circumstance. Um, so, yeah, so it wasn't totally surprising, but it is a blow for Nebraska. It's another four-star defensive back, another Florida kid um, decided that he came here for a little bit and then needed to go um, and pursue something else. Um, so it's, it's not great news for Nebraska, uh, but not totally uh, unsup- not totally surprising if you're kind of following kind of what his decision process had been like. Greg, Travis Fisher was on Sports Nightly on Thursday night, I believe, and he actually didn't mention Francois once in the interview, but still seemed excited about the uh, the prospects of the guys returning to this defensive back room coming up in 2020. Uh, what kind of competition are we looking at in 2020? And could we see a Nabab Joseph make a late addition to this roster and, and make some noise in fall camp? So I think that there's still the defensive back group is, is still really talented, and there's a lot of guys to still be excited about. I think you're going to have really good competition, um, and guys because of the way that Travis Fisher coaches them, you, you've got a lot of versatility um, in that room, and so you have a, a couple of guys that you know are going to see the field a lot: Nicafrio Budo and Cam Taylor Britt. Um, then you have up and comers like Clinton Newsom, Braxton Clark, um, and in the safety position, you know Markel Dismuke and, and Deontay Williams. Um, um, are going to probably have grips on the starting jobs, but you don't know where Miles, Miles Farmer is going to fit in with that. You know the coaching staff loves him. Um, Neil Pola Gates, is, as Fisher mentioned last night on Sports Nightly, is rehabbing nicely from his injury as well. Um, and so, like you mentioned, Joseph is a guy that they have their eye on uh, for that last 2020 spot. They still have one scholarship left. Um, that they can give out for the 2020 class as a late addition. Um, And they're hoping that Joseph ends up taking that. It'll kind of be like the Keen Green situation last year where nothing's official until he actually shows up on campus because he can't actually sign a letter of intent ahead of time. He just has to show up and enroll in classes, and that's how he's actually locked down for Nebraska. Nebraska did pick up a commitment this weekend, or this week, excuse me, and people were wondering, is this Nebraska's last scholarship? Sounds like it's a preferred walk-on for uh, Jaquez Yant, um, but kind of talk me through that recruitment. Why did he commit to the Huskers so late? Yeah, his, his, he's a really interesting recruitment. He's a guy that they, Nebraska had been on um, for a while, and I, I, I I think the situation there is that they didn't, the teams didn't know if he would qualify academically. Um, some of those rules kind of got relaxed a little bit in response to COVID um, as the NCAA clearinghouse kind of made some tweaks to, to what was happening there. And then he had an opportunity to, uh, to pursue college football right away. Um, but then it needed to be as a walk on because a lot of teams were filling up um, with different spots. So whenever you can get a guy um, that was a mid to high three star player out of Florida um, that had scholarship offers, you know, coming out of high school to other places, including Nebraska, just didn't work out to a scholarship now at Nebraska. That, that's a pretty good pickup. Um, a little bit of confusion of whether or not he's going to actually come in and play running back or linebacker. Um, he did play both in high school. I, I think that he had good running back film. I also thought he had good linebacker film, showed some good explosion. So that remains to be seen. Uh, but anytime you can pick a guy up uh, that has that, co- that kind of quality high school career this late in the game as a walk-on, you'll take that as a bonus and see what you get. If you had to guess now, where do you think the Husker coaches want him playing? Is it running back or is it linebacker? I would guess linebacker at this point, um, but the running back room is a little, it's unproven. Um, as Held was on Sports Nightly a couple of weeks ago, and he's really excited about the guys that he has in his room, but they could use a little bit more proven depth. Um, but Yance is not that either because he'd be a freshman walk on coming in, but I could see him at linebacker to start out with. Greg, I want to move on uh, to another commitment Nebraska could pick up this weekend. It's Marquez Buford. Apologies if I, if I said the name incorrectly. But recent reports indicated that he may be a lean towards Nebraska. He said he's going to be committing tomorrow uh, afternoon, I do believe. Uh, do we know? I mean, he, he's the number one prep player in the country from down in Texas. Uh, do we know, is Nebraska the, the school for him, the school to beat? And also, what is he, could he bring to this Nebraska team? I do think that Nebraska is in a good position with him. He is committing tomorrow afternoon. Um, and he's a really versatile player. It'd be the 
I think the three years in a row or three out of four years where Nebraska has picked up a quality prep school player going back to when Casey Rogers committed to the team. Um, then you had Alante Brown um, from this most recent recruiting class uh, who enrolled early. And then you, you would have Buford if he elects to commit tomorrow. Um, out of the same prep school as, as um, Alante Brown was at St. Thomas More in Connecticut, he's a really versatile player. Uh, when he was down in high school in Texas, he played both offense and defense, a running back wide receiver. Uh, defensive back, he returned kicks and punts, um, was a really talented player and a key piece on a team that won back-to-back state championships down in Texas. Um, he's a, he'll be a good get if Nebraska can get him because any time that Travis Fisher can get his hands on those versatile players like Cam Taylor Britt and some of the other guys that he's brought in, uh, he really likes to get those guys. Which side of the ball do the coaches like Buford for? Uh, defense. They like him at cornerback to start. Cornerback to start. Sounds good. Uh, Greg, another thought here on Marcus and Bow. He released his top five uh, a couple days ago, and Nebraska is included. That's not obviously a surprise. But as we're looking forward in his recruitment, what are some dates that we should keep in mind? When is he looking to commit? So I don't know when he's looking to commit. I think the thing that, that you have to watch out for with the Huskers on this one is that they're, they are getting uh, tight on space. Um, we've, we've talked about this kind of – Scott Frost has kind of hit on this a little bit, and that this year is just not a year where they're going to have a lot of spots. It's not anticipated that they're going to take a full 25. Um, it may be closer to 20 in this class just because of how young the football team is. And in theory, we say in theory because you never know with Nebraska because it just happened again where you had weird attrition. Um, they should not have as much attrition still because now you have a roster made up primarily of Scott Frost guys, even though they're very young, right? Um, and so if that's the case, then Nebraska already has um, a handful of offensive linemen committed to the class, so I don't know if there's room for a fourth offensive lineman um, unless they view uh, the guys a really elite prospect. And so it might be tough for him Bob, to find a spot in Nebraska's class, um, even though he has been recruited by them for a long time. He's really tight with the other commits in the class, like Henry Lutowski and those guys, uh, but it just may not work out for him in Nebraska this time. Last recruit I want to get an update on, Greg, and I think you know where i got to go. It's Thomas Fedoni. <laughs> he was, uh, looked like doing some 7-on-7 seven seven up in Omaha uh, this week, playing some uh, Omaha high school teams. Do you get a chance to see any of his, uh, of his action up in Omaha, and do you have an update? I did not get to see any of his action in Omaha. Um, I would assume that he did very well. Uh, uh, that's what the film looked like, yeah. Yeah, because every time you see film, like it's really kind of, it's very, very impressive um, when you see him on film, and whether or not it's this 7-on-7. Seven seven, um, I think there was a Rivals camp back in like January, way back when, it feels like years ago now, um, where he really burst onto the national scene and he was dominating. Um, every time you see him, it feels like he's getting better and better, which is what you would expect from a kid who, as a tight end, is a borderline five-star, because that's extremely rare. Um, there's no real update on, on Fedoni. I think that he's continuing to be patient um, and wants to see if he can take his visits. If he can take his visits, I still think he's taking one to LSU, and I think he'd probably take one to Michigan. Um, if you can get the full five, um, we'll see if he expands that to other schools, but he's plenty familiar with what Nebraska and even Iowa have to offer at this point, um, but he's continuing to be patient through the process because um, as I kind of alluded to before, he's one of the rare guys out out there that really does have the luxury of being as patient as he wants to be because no one has given away Thomas Fedoni's spot. They will save him a spot if, they, if he wants to be in their class. Greg, last thought here before we let you go. we got about 45 seconds left. Uh, and I want to look at recruiting going forward, uh, especially when you look at JUCO in 2020 because all the junior colleges are going to be playing in the spring. How is that going to affect Nebraska's ability to recruit the JUCO players in this class of 2021? Yeah, that's it's going to be insane to be honest because one of the things that you just it's going to be really tough. Like if you're a and if you're a guy like say Omar Manning who was in Nebraska's last class who's going to already be a national recruit and have a lot of offers, those types of kids you don't they don't really need to worry, right? If, if the season is going to be played later or whatever, um, it's the kids like Ativa uh, Maga Clements who kind of burst on the scene late, who needed that extra practice time, who needed that extra game film, and then still had to have 
have um, a last minute addition to a class with Nebraska, um, those are the guys that are going to be really hurt. So you need coaches that have a good ear to the ground in JUCO recruiting and have good relationships out there so that they can hear about these kids because otherwise it's going to be really difficult um, to recruit JUCOs with how little film there's going to be out there and little development and keeping those kids on track in the classroom without the, the care of the football in front of them as well. Hale Varsity's recruiting insider Greg Smith with us here on Hale Varsity Radio. Greg, enjoy your weekend and throw something on the grill for me, all right? I will do. You guys you have a good weekend, too. Chime in, 402-466-ESPN, or email the show, chris at hailvarsity.com. Just try me. Try me. Back to Hale Varsity Radio. We're back in on a Friday. It's Hale Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Elijah Herbal, alongside Damon Barr, as we fill in for Schmitty, out for today, watching his son play some baseball. Good luck. To, uh, to Chris's son out there playing baseball in the heat. Hope he does not melt out there. It's brutal. Uh, walking in, it was just, I mean, I was leaving my house coming over here and it was just, oh. Uh, one of those ones where you walk outside and it's just like, I want to go right back inside. And I haven't experienced many of those days this summer so far. We, we've had a pretty decent summer with that. Maybe it's because we've been locked indoors the entire time. Who knows? Uh, but I felt like this summer's been pretty, pretty mild. The rains come at pretty opportune times. Can't complain about this summer, but this weekend, this weekend is shaping up to be a hot one. And I'm not looking forward to going out and staying in the sun tomorrow, but you know, sometimes you got to do what you got to do for a paycheck. Uh, Speaking of which, NHL, NBA, and MLB all coming back this, uh, in the next coming weeks, I guess, to finish their seasons. Uh, MLB shortened down to a 60 game season, obviously. NBA, each team has a couple of play-in games. Uh, which they will be starting here at the beginning of August before we continue through with the playoffs. NHL starting up right, uh, beginning with the playoffs when they start back up. Three really good options. I'm probably going to be watching all three. But Damon, I got to ask you, which are you most excited for right off the bat? When you hear those three, which are you most excited for? I'm really excited to finish this NBA season. It has been, uh, it was so hyped up last off season. Everything. Everything was changing. Everyone was moving teams. The Battle of L.A. was going to happen. I I want to see all these storylines kind of wrap up and finally get an end to what should have ended, you know, a month ago. And Like, this whole, their bubble down in Disney World has just added such another interesting storyline to the season. I mean, the the season was going to be interesting no matter what. It was kind of the first season where you didn't walk into the season and go, well, one of these two teams is going to win it all. When I mean, you're looking at Cleveland and Golden State for years, or Miami you knew was going to be in the finals every single year, so on and so forth. Uh, we finally had like a wide open year where you thought the Clippers, Kawhi Leonard, Paul George, Pat Bev, those guys could go win it. Or you got Anthony Davis and LeBron James. Those guys are, I mean, they're they're two of the best players in the game and they're together on a team. Obviously, you got to put them directly into the the championship talk. And then out in the east, you got the Milwaukee Bucks, who Giannis is unstoppable alongside all the, the shooters that they have placed around uh, around Giannis and that Milwaukee Bucks team. Uh, you got the Celtics. Uh, who am I forgetting here? Uh, I'm interested to see if the Sixers kind of mm. surge during this uh, little playoff stunt here. The Sixers are an interesting one because they have, among the teams that are coming back for the restart, they have by far and away the best home record. I'm pretty sure they've lost something crazy like two or three games all year at home. But among the teams coming back from the restart, I think they have like the second worst road record. So it's going to be interesting to see how they'll play in a neutral court. Did the, did the home fans help them? Did they just really struggle with their plane trips? Who knows? But the, the Sixers are an interesting one to keep an eye on. Uh, as a Nuggets fan, I'm obviously super excited because the Nuggets, uh, when the season ended, were third in the West. And Nikola Jokic went and dropped 40 pounds during quarantine. So it's going to be interesting to see how he plays. But, I mean, these storylines are just are, are crazy now. Uh, you have players opting out of the season saying, I don't want to go do this restart. I don't want to go self-isolate down in Disney World, which doesn't sound that bad. Um, but I don't want to go do that. So you opt out. And then you have these these old players who haven't played in a couple of years coming back in. You got J.R. Smith, a.k.a. J.R. Swish. Uh, you got, let's see, uh, Joakim Noah, I believe, is coming back. Uh, I'm forgetting a couple here. Uh, but just interesting names coming back, uh, replacing guys that, you know, maybe don't have the name appeal that these, these, other, these other guys have. Um, and then you also have the whole aspect that 
everything they're doing in the NBA is done in Disney World. How cool is that? Like, you'll see these guys vlogging, and it's just them in Disney World. Uh, and then you have the, the aspect of the guys messing up their bubble and being forced to self-isolate. How about the snitch hotline? That's one of the funniest things ever. The NBA, uh, if you haven't heard, down in the bubble, they have a snitch hotline. So if you want to call anonymously and report somebody for their actions, oh, they broke they broke their uh, their bubble. They they walked too far to get their postmates, and they walked out of the bubble, and they could have contracted COVID. You can you can just call up a hotline directly to the NBA, all anonymous, and you can snitch on somebody. How hilarious is that? What's going to happen in a month and a half, whenever it's the Western Conference Finals, and you got the the Clippers and the Lakers battling out, and you got Kawhi Leonard? Oh, I saw I saw LeBron James breaking quarantine last night. I swear to you. And I mean, I don't think the the NBA guys would do that. But you never know. Fun storyline there. But, I mean, I don't want to discount the NHL or the MLB. The NHL's got some fun storylines, too, because they're going straight into the playoffs. And it's hockey. Without fans, uh, I know that the game broadcast for, these, uh, for all these playoff games, they're going to have extra mics down by the ice. It's because they want to have the better ambiance. of They, they want the, the experience of you being down on the ice. But hockey players cuss like sailors, dude. Like, that guy with the, the bleep, the little five-second delay, he is going to be so busy, which is going to make things fun. Can, can we finally hear how hockey players actually talk to each other down on the ice? I'm not sure if you, anyone out there has ever seen the uh, the NHL players mic'd up. We're just hilarious stuff. Where They'll be sitting there next to a uh, next to a face-off, and one guy will look at the other guy and go, hey, you want to go? And the guy will go, all right, and the puck will drop, and they'll turn to each other, drop the gloves, and fight. Like how awesome is that? Yeah, we're can, gonna be we're gonna be able to hear it all. Can we get a couple mic'd up fights during these playoffs? Can we, let's mic up the refs. How cool would that be if you get to hear what the refs are saying to the players, what the players are saying to the refs? I think micing up professional sports is just uh, it makes it more enjoyable. I think it, it's fun. It, it's like something new. There's no crowd, so how are we going to add to this experience? And I feel like yeah, you might eh, there might be a few bad words you don't want to put on TV. But like if you want to, especially if the leagues want to sell this to people like this online experience where you're hearing everyone mic'd up, I would pay for that in a heartbeat. You know, what? I want to hear some weird like Canadian and Russian insults like the ones I've never I got to add to my repertoire. It'd be awesome to hear some weird insult that I've never heard from northern Canada that is now being broadcast to uh, 10 million people live in an NHL game. I can add that to my repertoire. How awesome would that be? That's what I mean. That's why I hope they don't bleep anything out. I want to hear it all. I want to hear what these guys are saying to each other. Um, but I, I don't want to discount here. we got about a minute left, so I don't want to discount the MLB. Um, actually, I kind of do because of the whole situation that they put us through. This whole No one wants to listen to the billionaires fighting the millionaires. No one wants to hear that. And you finally get back around to baseball, and all these guys are opting out. You're only playing 60 games. Um, but it's still baseball. It's still America's pastime. And... Will I flip on the TV for opening night and watch the first game and see how it is? Uh, I believe it's Nationals and Yankees, which is already a good matchup. I mean, as much as I was just trashing on the MLB for their handling of this whole COVID thing, I'm still going to turn on and watch some baseball. 60 games is lame, though. That's why I'm, I'll watch opening night, and then I'm not going to care until the playoffs come around. Because I don't think 60 games is going to be enough to determine a, a perfect playoff field, um, which could bring some excitement. Uh, you also have the, the NL incorporating the DH this year. Uh, so the NL is going to have a DH, which could make things a little bit more fun, maybe a little more high scoring in the, the NL. I don't know. All around, though, the, the storylines surrounding baseball and hockey are just, or sorry, uh, basketball and hockey are just better, right? Yeah, I think so. I think baseball really lost their chance. And we, we back in however long ago it was, we were talking about, yeah, baseball is going to lose their shot if they don't take it. And it looks like they did, in my opinion. It, I mean, in a way, in a way. I, I still think the NBA and the NHL restart is going to be a little bit more fun. I'm probably personally most excited for the NBA. Uh, so could be fun. Hail Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery, coming up, uh, finishing up Hour 1. And now... And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. Wrapping up Hour 1 here on Hale Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. It's Elijah Herbal and Damon Barr filling in for Chris, who has the day off. Back tomorrow, Saturday morning edition, 7 to 9, here on ESPN Lincoln. 
for the listeners across the state. If you don't get ESPN Lincoln where you're listening uh, to Hail Varsity today, you can always find that in the podcast form on iTunes, your favorite streaming service, or ESPNLincoln.com. Uh, excited for tomorrow's show as Chris is going to be out live at the uh, Tyson's Treasure Chest uh, annual golf tournament. Should be a good one, uh, I believe, with Searles. So, good to show, fun show planned tomorrow morning. Quick reminder that one out of every three fatal crashes involves an impaired driver. Driving drunk, buzzed, or high is never acceptable, and law enforcement officers are working around the clock to stop it with sobriety checkpoints and saturation patrols. As a driver, make the correct choice of a non-alcoholic drink or have a pre-selected designated driver. Be smart and start the conversation, who's driving home? A message brought to you by the Nebraska Department of Transportation Highway Safety Office. Damon, before we get out of here this hour, we got to talk bowl games. We ran out of time in the first segment for it, but as I said, Nick Caparelli, who is the executive director of the Football Bowl Association, said in an interview with The Athletic that he and the organization is determined to make bowls work in 2020. They plan on playing all of their bowl games, I believe 42 of them this year, which is up from 39 last year. Uh, and he said he's spoken to uh, members from all 10 of uh, the FBF uh, conferences, including commissioners and athletic directors. And he says that all are committed to maintaining bowl season. They want to have the bowl games. Chris has said it before. Conference championship games drive revenue for conferences. Well, guess what? So do bowl games. The more teams that you can get from your conference in a bowl game, the more revenue you're going to generate. It's a big deal. But they're still in the wait and see pattern. They don't know what's happening. It's essentially that they got to make it work with how this college football season works because they want to have bowl games. They're planning on having bowl games. When asked if spring bowl games could be a possibility this year, he said it's a challenge, but it's doable. Again, he's echoing the same sentiment. They're, they're committed to making sure bowl season happens this year. Which brings an interesting, an interesting argument you can make about Nebraska. Because Nebraska now, after missing three straight bowl seasons, three straight years without going to a bowl game, you got to think this is the, the year to do it. They've added three bowl games. Um, plus, if you're only playing Power 5 conferences, that, that drastically cuts the number of teams who are even going to be eligible to make a bowl game. And, I mean, when you look at the stats last year, only 70 teams across all of college football had a 500 or better record against their conference opponents. 70, which would leave 14 teams with the chance uh, of making a bowl game, even if your record this year is under 500. And that's, that kind of seems to be the, uh, the, the standard this year that they're, that they're throwing in. But he did say, towards the end of the interview, that this season, the record's not going to be the most important thing. They, they want to have bowl season this year as a celebration of college football. To say, we know this year was messed up, but we still have bowl season. It's a celebration of the sport. So, with all that in mind, Nebraska, more likely to make a bowl this year. Could be. Could be. I mean, there's going to be a lot more teams making a bowl this season that are under 500. Uh, Nebraska, with their brutal conference schedule, I think is a candidate to be a team that's just under 500, if not right at 500. And if what Nick Carparelli says turns out to be true, Nebraska could be looking to make a bowl here in 2020 long enough right took them long enough welcome to hail varsity radio the voice of husker nation insight opinion expertise with the biggest and best names talking nebraska across the state join the show on twitter at hail varsity and at schmidt underscore radio call in at 402-466-ESPN or 1-800-825-5865 here's chris schmidt we're back. It's hour two of Hail Varsity Radio here on a Friday. Elijah Herbal and Damon Barr filling in for Chris as Chris has the day off. Back tomorrow, if uh, you are missing him, t- tomorrow morning, Saturday morning edition, 7 to 9 here on ESPN Lincoln. But before we get to that, got a whole hour of Hail Varsity Radio left to get through. Starting off, we'll be talking with the pride of Fairbury himself, Bill Dolman. Bill, how you doing today? It's a lovely Friday, right? <laughs> I'm amused. If you're missing Chris, come on. I mean, s- some people I'm sure only listen to the show for him. We got some real big, uh, some real big Chris groupies out there. 
Okay, big shooter. All right, yeah, you're missing Chris. <laughs> I'm sure there's a pub somewhere down on the Haymarket where they can go find him. <laughs> Junior played baseball earlier today. He was asking for some rum and uh, yeah, some chickens, I think, to help out the team. But by now, let's face it, come on. Well, I, I was going to say you might be uh, might, might be hard to recognize now as the, the mayor of Lincoln has instituted a mask law. Um, but, Chris, I mean, it's the best hair in, in all of Lincoln radio, so it's hard to miss, right? <laughs> yeah, well, it certainly has the face for radio. <laughs> my dad told me that too when I got a job here. It's, uh, yep. It was warming to my heart. But Bill, yep. as I said, here in Lincoln, the mayor has instituted a mask law uh, mandatory in any public building or business beginning Monday. And I know that's been a thing for a while now out in Colorado. So do you have a message for the people of Lincoln? Uh, here's what I, I always find strange about this. We are going into a mask ruling or mandatory mask Five days from now, why can't you do it right now? I mean, how tough is that? You know, but you always get this, we're doing it in three days. Um, uh, you know, it's what it's, there's, there are so many studies about it that say different things. I think you just do what you, you know, what you're told to do for a while. And then once they come up with something else, then you go do whatever you're allowed to go do and uh, call it good. My main thing it's just getting enough oxygen to breathe, because quite frankly, I don't think there's a lot of people that are breathing the, 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 the cleanest air in the world when they've got those masks on. And I think I read a story earlier today that some guy was driving with his mask, passed out, and crashed his car in New Jersey. So huh. be careful when you're wearing your mask. See, the only thing that, that I've learned is, I'm sure my dentist is happy, is i got to brush my teeth, like, all the time, I throw my mask on and go, man, I didn't brush my teeth before I left the house this morning. So I'm sure my dentist just <laughs> loves this mask law. Yeah, I, 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 there's just so many studies, so many opinions, and so many, so many that you just go, all right, what am I supposed to go do, and where am I supposed to go do it, and then I will just let me breathe oxygen. At some point, just let me breathe some oxygen, and uh, we'll get through this. I mean, obviously, it's, it's to, to stop the spread, but one of the things, if you're listening to this show – Kind of seems like you got to wear a mask if you want to want college football here in a, in a few months. I guess a little over a month now. So I mean, just wear it, stop the spread, and and let's let's get some college football. Am I right? Well, you know, I saw that. Uh, I don't know what Nebraska's policy is or if they've come out with one. I saw that Illinois is is uh, limiting its capacity to twenty thousand people, which I thought that that's what they've been doing over the last uh, couple of decades anyway. <laughs> uh, so I'm not exactly sure that, how different that's going to look. You know, I remember doing a uh, when I was doing the Salt Dogs, uh, one of the highlights of my career, by the way. Uh, I remember watching uh, an afternoon baseball game from Miami. Uh, I think they were still the Florida Marlins at the time. They had four hundred people in the stands at a Major League Baseball game in an afternoon. Uh, there were more stadium workers there than there were people in the seats. And, and let's face it, there are, there are some, you know, uh, baseball stadiums when everything is okay that don't have a lot of people in the seats. The Jacksonville Jaguars certainly haven't had people in the seats either. Uh, so I don't know what college football is going to look like in the fall. At some point they're going to be looking at data, but they're also going to be looking at dollar signs to make the decision, you know, that they're finally going to settle on. I still think that there's going to, that that's going to be football um, in the fall. Maybe that's just for the power fives and the, the, the division, uh, the, the, the high level teams. And maybe your, your uh, division twos uh, division and, and three and NAIA. And I know junior colleges, I don't think junior college is playing this fall. Yeah, they're maybe, they have, spring. maybe they have spring ball, you know, maybe, maybe all of those, you know, I don't really know what the difference is. I just know that money's going to talk at some point and maybe not just money, but the, you know, for the psyche of, of the, the population to have it. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe you only have power five football this fall. Who knows? And, and everybody else plays and gets to, gets to be on center stage in the spring and, That'll be great for them, too. I, I, I don't know what it's going to look like, but I would really be surprised if everything is shut down so much that there isn't football in the fall uh, in the colleges, and especially in its, you know, population centers like Nebraska versus those, and I've said this on the show before, you know, maybe, maybe it, it looks a lot different in Los Angeles 
than it does look like in Lincoln because, you know, Nebraska has done extremely well in containing whatever's going on, and you've got issues on the, on the major population centers. So uh, if they've got to play games in uh, certain regions and not in others, maybe that's what it looks like. But uh, maybe, maybe it is just a thing where it's Power 5 in the fall and everybody else in the spring. Bill, we don't know a lot about what college football is going to look like in the fall, but we do know that the Big Ten is moving forward with the 10-game conference-only schedule at the moment. And we didn't get a chance to ask you about this last week because we were spending so much time on Colin Cowherd, um, which is okay. I I think that needed to be addressed. But now i got a chance to ask you, what do you think of Nebraska playing 10 games this season, all of them interconference games? Well, I I, I think I mentioned this you know, several weeks ago. So it's, it's, you know, they're obviously, you know, the folks in the big 10 office listen to the show when I'm on, obviously. Uh, and, uh, cause I think uh, there was, I speculated that that might be what happens. Um, and then you find, you know, I did, I, I thought maybe what they might do though, is say, look, we're not going to go play, you know, games in those high, high population areas, which you've got high concentrations of, um, of the virus or, or the, you know, the numbers are, are much more intense. So maybe some of those open dates have to, or maybe those non-conference games have to be scrapped and you've got to kind of piece together a schedule. So the fact that it's all conference games, okay. Um, but could Nebraska play South Dakota State? Probably. probably. You know, that, that probably would not have been an issue. Cincinnati, well, if you're going to have Ohio State playing, then why, Nebraska, why couldn't Nebraska have played Cincinnati? Um so, you know, it, it, it's stuff like that. But if this is the way they've settled on it, that you're going to, I don't know how you control it. I'm sure they say it's better, it's more easier, it's an easier way to control it. I don't know how that is. But if it just makes sense, then, then go with it and play, play the games that you had scheduled, you know, in Lincoln and the games that you have scheduled on the road, go out of those and fill in the blanks with the other games and make everybody be flexible those extra, what, three or four games a year of the year. Bill, obviously still a lot of time before the season. At the moment, the plan, though, is that 10-game conference schedule. But another option that I know has been popular among Husker fans has been an idea of just playing regional opponents. We'll play Iowa, Iowa State, Kansas, Kansas State, maybe renew some of those old Big 12 rivalries. And That sounds fun. I mean, it's pretty incontestable. It'd be awesome to go play Missouri and Kansas, maybe Oklahoma. Um, but I think for conference revenues, the getting these conference games in more important well, I, I I can see that. Yeah, absolutely. And you've also got you know everything that would be available to the all the inventory would be available to the Big Ten Network and all the other conference TV partners. I mean that's that just for simplicity's sake and getting games on, you know that may be one of the things that's driving this decision, as opposed to well we've got a Big Twelve school and who, who, you know what networks can carry that game and who has the rights to this game and that. I mean this is just flat out Big Ten partners and every game's going to be on and everybody's going to see it. But you know that's what I was saying. If if you've got a game, where I, I think I, I, I want to say that Penn State or was going to play one of the Big Ten schools had a big game out west. Maybe it was Ohio State and Oregon or something like that. And maybe maybe you decide, okay, we can't play that. We can't go out of the Midwest and go play on the West Coast where things are really weird right now and for a number of reasons. So that's an open date where instead of it's Ohio State and Oregon, and may, maybe it is Ohio State taking on Cincinnati or something in the Mideast, Midwest region, and you just have to have that flexibility with somebody who else who might have had, you know, had an open date uh, come up. Yeah, that'd be great if, uh, okay, you know, this year we're just going to, you know, kind of mix and max our schedule and Nebraska plays K-State, Iowa State, Minnesota, Iowa. Okay, that'd be fine. I, I feel bad for South Dakota State because, let's face it, that, that game in Lincoln, it was South Dakota State, right? It wasn't South Dakota. but Yeah, South Dakota I mean, State. That, yeah, I mean, that's their budget for the year. You know, that game was incredibly important for South Dakota's bank account, South Dakota State's bank account. So I really feel bad for, for schools like that that are losing these big money games that are going to finance their entire athletic department for the year. I mean, that really, really hurts. And that's where I wish they could have come up with a plan to allow some of those schools, you know, where you're not in a uh, high intensity region with the virus and all the other stuff that Nebraska and South Dakota state could have played. It would have worked out, you know, there's not a lot of, you know, things to worry about, 
and that school is going to be able to get the money that it so desperately needs. And I'm sure now they've got a lot of questions about how they're going to move forward. And there are a lot of other schools around the country. Maybe you can play one of those money games, and for Nebraska it should be a win. Uh, but, you know, you take care of some of these schools. But, you know, I go back to what I said earlier, maybe South Dakota State and all the schools like it don't play in the fall, and they play in the spring, and that's just the way it's going to be for them. Uh, but they're going to be listening out on a, on a huge, huge payday, whereas Nebraska and the Big Ten schools – are, are going to get that TV money and that Big Ten network money, and that is incredibly important uh, for all of the schools. Bill, as you look at this 2020 season, um, it's it's just so weird. I mean, that, that's what I keep coming back to. It's so weird. We don't know what's going on, and we're not going to know really until this, the, the schedule for Nebraska releases. But is this a lost season for college football or even just for Nebraska in particular? I mean, can you define – how this season could be considered successful for Nebraska? Uh, not really, no. Um, I, I, I think it's only a lost season if there is no season. I think if you get to play and you get to provide people with that escape, you know, for, well, in Nebraska's case, you know, for, the, for each week, you know, a lot of places, you know, games are a distraction for, you know, four or five hours on a Saturday afternoon. For us, and I say us, even though I'm out here in Colorado, for those of us, you know, who are passionate about Nebraska football, Nebraska athletics, like, and I throw volleyball, wrestling, all these sports into it, you know, this, this, this gets us through, you know, this is part of our life, you know, from Sunday to, you know, Saturday and from, you know, for every, every day of the week. So Nebraska football, if they play, it's, it's going to be, you know, culturally significant to the psyche of the state and for fans everywhere, you know? So do I think Nebraska is going to have a down season, you know, wins and losses? I I don't know how you, how you really conceptualize that at this point, but I think if if you play and you get 10 games in and you give people something to cheer about and to talk about and to be excited about and, and think about something else, I I think that's, I think that's a win. You know, I, I know he's ever talked about what's the bowl situation. I mean, is there going to be a bowl season? I would doubt it. You know, I really would doubt it. But nobody ever talks about that. Well, they Bill, get the regular season games in. So uh, I don't know if Nebraska is going to make a bowl game this year or not. Um, but I, regardless, regardless, I think if Nebraska plays and other schools, you know, Iowa and Minnesota, and although know, Minnesota's kind of lost to Minneapolis and you know gets dwarfed by the Vikings, but in areas where college football is supremely important, I think if you play, it's a win. Bill Dolman with us here on Hale Varsity Radio. And, Bill, we actually discussed bowl season a little bit in the first hour. Uh, Nick Carparelli, he's the executive director of the Football Bowl Association. He had an interview with The Athletic, uh, I believe, yesterday. And he essentially said that the bowls, uh, all the sites, all all the locations, have been in communications with uh, all 10 FBS conferences, uh, both athletic directors and commissioners, and they are determined to make bowl season work. Uh, it seems to be a revenue thing. When you go read the interview, it seems to be that all the conferences and all the bowls want their money, but they're determined to make it work, and they want to call it a celebration of the sport because they know it, it could be so weird with a lot of teams that maybe aren't deserving of making it in. Um, but Nebraska's barometer has been making a bowl game for the past three years. Would it be a confidence boost, even in a weird season like this, to just make a bowl game? Sure, absolutely. I, I, I think if Nebraska goes... Five and five, six and four. I wouldn't think. I, I, I'm talking on the low end. I think you know Nebraska could win seven games this year. Why not? Um, sure, making making a bowl game is going to be uh, a, a significant thing, and I think you'd probably have a significant amount of Nebraska folks who, in December, when things are probably settled down, and let's say should the election's going to be over, you know things might be different, and Nebraska fans would probably still travel reasonably well. Um, you know those bowls are. <laughs> Sometimes you you watch those bowl games, and just like I was talking earlier with attendance, you don't have a ton of people on the stands anyway, unless Nebraska is playing or it's a playoff game, right? But you know those bowls, they make their money off sponsorships, they make their money off of whatever ESPN pays them because they have basically all of the bowls wrapped up under contract. But I can remember a few years ago when UConn had its one good season, and they went out to the Fiesta Bowl to play. I mean, they had to break the bank in stores just to play in that game. I mean, they're talking about selling 
you know, tickets. They had to buy the unused tickets. The band had to pay for tickets. People had to pay, you know, for the travel and, and paid for un, a, you know, a minimum number of hotel rooms. I mean, it cost UConn. Now, this is over 10 years ago. But as I recall, it cost UConn like over $2 million to play in the Fiesta Bowl. Ooh. So when they're talking about trying to get those games going, those bowls have a lot of money on the line for those communities and for those organizations. So, they, they, yeah, they're going to want to try and get as many of them on as they possibly can. And not a lot of them are, are going to worry about whether they're actually people in the seats or not because they're going to get the money anyway, one way or the other. Bill, good stuff today, as always. Uh, we're out of time here for you, so i got to let you go. But stay healthy what? and stay safe out there. Let's just blow off the brakes. Let's just keep going on going. I'm, I'm sorry I wish, but it's, it's, it's above right. my pay grade. All right. Well, I'll go talk some college football with the folks out here in Colorado. And uh, trust me, it'll be a short conversation. <laughs> and we're back. Fellas, you think we could listen to the radio? On Hale Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Yes! That's awesome! Rolling through a Friday here on Hale Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Elijah Herbal alongside Damon Barr, filling in for Chris, who has the day off. Remember, you can find the show uh, today on Twitter at ESPN Lincoln or at Hale Varsity. You know, Damon's working hard posting these interviews uh, that we have had today. Remember, Greg Smith had some recruiting recon back in hour one, and you just heard from Bill Dolman. Uh, good stuff talking about that 10 game schedule. Uh, all those going to be available a little bit after the show on ESPNLincoln.com or the ESPN Lincoln Twitter. But we're now excited to welcome back to the show the Colton Stone. You can find him and follow him on Twitter at two birds underscore one stone. Colton, been about nine months, I think, since we've had you on the show last. How you doing? Dude, I'm all right. Uh, yeah, it's been a while. Uh, I Every time I remember uh, that, that you fill in, and I remember, of course, filling in many a summer with Danny, so I was like, man, I need to, I need to text Elijah and try to hop on one of these days you know chris likes to take his days off so um, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know how following uh bill dolman's gonna go but i'm pretty good i'm out of my porch so hopefully there's not a lot of noise but trying to take in the weather before it's 100 degrees tomorrow well i mean you hit the nail on the head in that chris loves taking his vacation days but mostly in the summertime and oh, I, yeah. I think with this whole we don't know what's coming with college football he's like i'm, <laughs> I'm gonna watch my son's baseball team while i can respect to him for that I guess he's got to support his kids sometimes. Well, Colton, it's been a while since we talked to you. What have you been up to for the past oh eight nine months or so? Uh, you got married in that time, correct? Yeah, I got married right before I moved back to Omaha, um, and then kind of just it's been crazy. Obviously, some personal stuff going on. Which, uh, if you follow me on Twitter, you kind of know what's what's going on in uh, my personal life. Uh, then you know, COVID and everything hit, so I haven't really I haven't had a full time job since pretty much March. Um, you know, kind of just dealing with, with personal health and everything. I had a surgery back in May uh, on my nose. Um, worked some part time stuff, some seasonal stuff, and you know, I'm, I'm cashing unemployment checks and as long as I can. So, uh, but looking for work, just trying to, you know, it, it, like you said, we kind of are in a weird time right now where uh, we we don't know what's going to happen in the fall, so it's hard to. It's hard to kind of plan for it until you know what's going on. Um, but, I mean, I've been doing some podcast stuff on the side, just kind of trying to slowly build a following and do something from home and kind of go from there. So just trying to keep busy however I can. Gym's finally open. Pools are open. So, you know, golf on Tuesday. So just kind of trying to do whatever I can to keep busy, stay up the streets. Well, you heard it here first. If you're looking to uh, to hire somebody new to your business, you don't need to look at LinkedIn or anything like that. Just just call my man Colton. Find him on Twitter at Two Birds One Stone. Good dude, even better employee. That's my plug for Colton for now. But but Colton, I'm, I'm sure then you've watched some good stuff on Netflix or Hulu during quarantine. I've been running a little bit dry, and I need some suggestions. Yeah, so uh, Blue through Ozark, Blue through Tiger King. Mm. Um, there's a couple of things that like you know my wife watches that I'm kind of like, I don't, I'll watch it. And then she'll fall asleep. And I'm like 15 episodes in. I'm like, I got to know what happens next. Um, <laughs> we watch dynasty on Netflix, which is like a re like a modernization of like the dynasty from like the eighties. Uh, that wasn't bad. Um, yeah, we're running out of stuff too. I'm even trying to think what we've watched recently. I, I watched, 
I I probably watch more YouTube than anything. And even then, it's like there's man, there's nothing on. Yeah, so, I have uh, run out of old Nebraska games to watch. I, I think yeah, I, I may have seen every not, game. And but... I'm not. Yeah, well, there you go. But I'm not up early enough to watch Korean baseball either. I should be, you know. But grinding on a little bit of Call of Duty, I guess. But we kind of just watch whatever. If something new pops up, we'll watch it. We'll go through all of it. And then not even know what we just watched. So I, I wish I had better suggestions, but I kind of I, I've run out too. Oh, that's that's a okay. I, Chris has been telling me I need to watch Ozark. I believe Damon's oh, been dude. telling me to watch Ozark. I've been missing out, I guess. Yeah, yeah, it is definitely worth. It's one of those. It's definitely one of those shows that you know you watch one episode and you think you're good. You can watch one and like go to bed, but it's like you've got to watch three. But then you're up an extra hour or two because some of it's so dark that it's like. You don't feel comfortable sleeping at night, so. But it's definitely worth it. I mean, it's only three seasons, thirty episodes. What is that? Thirty hours. Yeah, I mean, you could do it in two days. Well, I, I gotta say, if you were a Game of Thrones fan, I know Game of Thrones left a big old hole in my heart uh, when that show uh-huh. ended. And I found The Last Kingdom on Netflix. It's a little bit more based in reality than uh, than Game of Thrones, but it, it's a good one if you kind of like that era. Yeah, I might have to. I never really got into Game of Thrones, not because I was like. The hipster that said, you know, I, I'm not going to watch it because everyone else watches it. I just, I don't know. It, it sounds like my type of show, you know, but at the same time, it's, it's a lot. And you've got to, you get invested in characters, then they die. And it's like, I don't know if I have that kind of a, emotional space right now. Yeah, I'm glad that doesn't happen on The Office. I'm glad you don't get, like, emotionally invested in some character like The Office or Parks and Rec and they just die out of nowhere. That'd be and then they're just, like, gone. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it just it really ruins the show-watching experience. But, but Colton, I think this is a sports talk show. We should probably get into some sports here. Uh, maybe a little bit, yeah. Maybe a little bit. And it's been tough because there's been really nothing on. But we do have some sports starting up here soon. We discussed it back in Hour 1, Damon and I. And that's within the next two weeks, we have the MLB, the NHL, and the NBA all starting back up. And th- my relationship with the MLB is a little rocky right now because of what happened within the past two months. Um, but yeah. I'll put it out to you. Of those three sports, which do you think is going to be the most compelling once they finally restart? Um, that's just a good question. I honestly think if you're just a casual sports fan and you're not, you know, you're not diehard one sport, I, I would lean NHL. I'm also a big hockey guy, so that's not really fair. But I think the reason is is that they, I think the way they have their format set up, um, you know, might work out better for them just because. You know, I feel like it'll be more competitive hockey. Hockey's kind of a sport where uh, there's a reason it's seven-game series. You never know who's going to win uh, on every, any given night. Uh, my my beef with the MLB a little bit is, one, the 60-game season, when we could have had a 100-game season, um, had everyone just kind of uh, complied and, and, you know, agreed on a deal sooner. 60 games, yeah, every game matters, but at the same time, you might get a team – like the Mariners or, uh, you know, I don't want to say the Orioles. They've been kind of bad recently. But, you know, a team like that, they could go hot, you know, win 30, 40 games and don't make the playoffs. But you're going to have a team that just is slow to catch up and, and, and just doesn't have, have time. Uh, and then there's a reason it's 162 games. And as far as the NBA goes, who knows? Um, I think it's kind of a crapshoot just because the way they're kind of doing their playoff. So, I mean, I, I would say NHL, but any sports at this point are welcome back. I mean, I watched a little bit of the – it's called the basketball tournament, and my Marquette Golden Eagles took the win in that. So, uh, that was cool. At least to get something back. But it's, it's weird, but I, I think I'd go hockey. I mean, one of the more interesting things to hockey for me, and I hit on this with Damon first hour, is it might be the best sport without fans because you get to hear what's said down on the ice. And if, if you've seen any NHL, yeah. Mike – uh, NHL players mic'd up. It's just it's hilarious. They're just awesome when they're down there chirping each other. Oh yeah. Well, and then on top of that, I mean, you got to think of hockey is like if you made football ten times harder, basically, and then made, and made the the ball in this case a putt ten times smaller. Yeah. And it's just it's 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 incredible that I mean you've had guys that have had like heart attacks on the ice and like get revived on the bench and come back out. It's like it's. It's incredible. It's an electric sport. Um, I, I hate that every year uh, when the Sharks actually play well, 
the times I want to watch hockey, they, they don't put them on national TV because they're too busy showing, you know, NBA playoffs or they're too busy showing just the middle of the summer MLB game. And, you know, you've, you've got something so raw and so good that you could put on, put on TV and they, they kind of just go the opposite way. So, I mean, I, I love hockey, so it's kind of a biased opinion. Well, we are living in America, though, Colton, and football is king here. And I, I know as the weeks have passed, it's just been less and less likely that we're going to get a college football season. NFL, it's kind of its own animal. We'll, we'll leave that one to be because um, NFL, I, they got to have a season even if there's no fans. But college football, really still up in the air at this point. I mean, we know Big Ten is looking at a 10-game conference schedule. But at this point, are you still hopeful for a college football season? Gosh, I mean, I go back. I, every day I kind of go back and forth where, you know, I don't have to tell anybody to put on a mask. I don't think that's uh, – I don't think I'm coming up with a novel idea there. But, you know, if we would have been requiring it months ago, we, we may not be having this, this discussion right now. But my thing with it is if, if they're going to do it, they kind of have to go conference only. And I know people have kind of been up in arms about it, even if, you know – say Georgia, Georgia Tech, like they're right down the road from each other, but you can't really, the reason you, you need it conference only is so you can mandate the protocols, you know, how often are people getting tested? You've got to keep it within your conference. Um, so I think if they find a way to make that work, I'm, I'm somewhat hopeful, but every day that goes by that a D3 or a D2 or the MEAC, the SWAC, that somebody cancels, and NAIA, JUCOs, they move theirs. Every day that something like that happens, I get a little less and less hopeful. So, I mean, I'd say right now, gosh, I don't want to say slim to none, but it feels like it's like a 25% chance at the moment. It, it feels bleak. Well, if we do have a season, which I'm crossing my fingers for it, I'm still hopeful. Until I get the word that there's no season, I will yeah, remain hopeful. Sure. Um, as we're looking at the Huskers in 2020, couple interesting storylines you got quarterback battle you got moving parts in the offensive line you got some new parts in the defensive line just looking at this season as a whole which storyline is most intriguing to you well other than if there will be a season or not because obviously that's, that's the biggest yeah that's the life. hugest one right now is that even a word hugest probably not but i, I can't the understand most, it enough the most large yeah so um you know, what I'm really interested to see is kind of how the, the defensive line, I know it's a little bit different than what you mentioned, how the defensive line rebounds. I know you have a lot of guys that have been on the team, but not a lot of guys that have, have seen too many reps. Obviously, you lose the Davis brothers, you lose uh, Darian Daniels, but you have guys that have, have been out there and know kind of what they're doing um, to, to fill those roles. But um, it'll be interesting to see how they, they kind of rebound from that. And as far as the offensive line goes, uh, you know, they were young last year. I know a lot of people kind of took that for granted that Martinez's first year, he had a pretty veteran offensive line. Um, and and it, they're like, what happened? You know, so, I mean, as, as we say a lot, the, the game of football starts in the trenches. And without those two clicking, I mean, there's not really a discussion about anything else. But I, I think if, if Frost is set on Martinez like he has been, I think the quarterback situation is is more about making sure the next guy is ready when it's his turn. Colton Stone joining us here on Hale Varsity Radio. You can find him, follow him on Twitter at two birds underscore one stone. Colton, appreciate the time. Is a good time talking with you. Yeah, no problem. I appreciate it. Yep. Stay safe and stay healthy out there. Right. Yeah. You too. And now, and now back to Hale Varsity Radio. Hail Varsity Radio presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Had to enjoy that song for a second because it's how I'm feeling as we're approaching the end of a Friday show. Looking forward to the weekend. Again, one more time, Chris will be back in tomorrow morning for the Saturday morning edition of Hail Varsity Radio. That's 7 to 9 here on ESPN Lincoln. For our listeners across the state, you can catch that podcast on HailVarsity.com, iTunes, or your favorite streaming service. Google Play, I think, has it. Uh, so you can catch that always, even if you're not in the city of Lincoln and you are not going to be required to be wearing a mask on Monday. So you, you don't get the, the, the Saturday morning show, but you don't have to wear a mask every single where you go. It, it's pros and cons. It's pros and cons, people. Um, I mean, 
you're missing out on a great product on Saturday mornings, don't get me wrong, but you don't have to wear a mask every single where you go, and I, I might be jealous of you come the end of August. We'll, we'll just leave it at that. Before we get out of here today, I, I do want to get into fantasy football, because it's just been kind of my... my it's, I've been looking into it a lot the past week. It's, it's been what I've... It, it's what I've been filling my time with. Um, my draft order, I've been in the same fantasy football league since sixth grade, actually. I went to Irving Middle School here in Lincoln, so it's still the Irving Fantasy Football League. And uh, we started off with 12 members. I think of the original 12, I think we're down to only five or six original members. When we got to high school, we expanded the league to 16, which was an awful plan. Way too many teams. I had some like trash players on my team. I think I finished second to last. And we ended up uh, forcing a, f- a few people out of the league because of that one, just because they hated that year so much. But we have the original five or six still, and we're still going strong now. Uh, don't make me do math. Almost 11 years later, probably 10, 11 years later. Uh, so it's going well. And last year was the first year since probably middle school that I felt really confident about my draft right whenever I finished it up. And, and I felt like I had a good season. And I think the prep starts now. My fantasy football draft is a little over a month away. We, we got a while still. It's right at the end of August. Classes are starting back up. We're going to get that fantasy football draft in. Hopefully by then we'll know what the NFL season is going to look like. But I'm just trying to figure out what my game plan has got to be going into this draft. Well, as somebody who has uh, floundered at fantasy football every time I've been given the chance, I, I haven't really played recently, and I was never good when I played it in school. Uh, what is your main strategy building your team? Well, my new strategy this past year, which worked really well for me, was to be the last person in my league to take a quarterback. Because you look at the NFL as a whole, and obviously you got your top two, three guys who could honestly just by themselves win you a fantasy game on a week-to-week basis. Patrick Mahomes, Lamar Jackson, uh, Peyton Manning. I remember he carried me back in middle school. I picked Peyton Manning first round every single year, and all my opponents were just pissed at me every single year because they said, it's not fair, Peyton Manning's dropping 50 for you. I said, well, you should have drafted him in the first round. Um, And then that strategy worked very poorly for me through high school. I I was still drafting a quarterback relatively high, um, and last year was the first year I, I set myself. I said, I am not going to pick a quarterback until all, all 11 other members of my league have picked their quarterback. And I ended up getting, uh, who did I get last year? Oh, 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 I got Jameis Winston. And I ended up dealing him away, and I ended up finishing the year. I had Russell Wilson. I, I had a really good team at the end of the year. Uh, I fell just short of the playoffs. I, I finished the last six weeks on a 5-1 and one, uh, five and one little spurt. And then... Um, I blew the last game of the year. I had Michael Thomas on my roster and I needed him to score like 14 points. But the problem was, was my opponent had Drew Brees who was just throwing Michael Thomas the ball. So it just was, it was, it was poor for me all around that. That was a disappointing last game. But my strategy going into last year was I am not going to draft a quarterback until it's the last one available. Ended up taking Michael Thomas in the first round. Great pick. Best season by a wide receiver, arguably ever. And then I, I started fortifying the running back position through later rounds, uh, or rounds two, three, four. You got Joe Mixon, Chris Carson, guys like that. Really happy with my season. So I, I'm just putting it out to you. If I'm avoiding the quarterback position, what direction do you think I should go in in the first round? I hmm. I mean, I am picking ninth this year. You're picking 12th, ninth. Which isn't ideal, which means, I mean, Christian McCaffrey is probably going to be off he, the board. He'll be gone. Saquon Barkley will be gone. Ezekiel Elliott's going to be gone. Maybe uh, uh, Titans. Titans. Derrick Henry? Derrick Henry. We'll see. I-, I have a feeling that in a lot of leagues he'll be available towards the bottom of the first, but I'm thinking in my league he's going to be gone. Really? Because, I mean, first round, I already know McCaffrey's probably the first pick. Saquon's going to be close behind. Zeke's going to be close behind. Mike Thomas is going to be close behind. I have a feeling Pat Mahomes is going in the first round, if not the second. And I don't want to reach that high for quarterback. Maybe stack up on uh, Kansas City receivers this year. Tyreek Hill? Tyreek Hill. Is that a first-round pick? It might not be a first-round pick, but a second-round pick. You, remember, if you're out there listening and you got advice from me, you can call the show. 402-466-3776. 1-800-825-5865. Damon's working the phones. Also, feel free to tweet at me, at Herbal Essences. If you're confused by that, it's not spelled like the shampoo. It's H-E-R-B-E-L. You can tweet at me. Give me your suggestions. Uh, I'm seeing Julio Jones 
that's a guy who I think will be available towards the bottom of the first round. Um, but Matt Ryan at quarterback concerns me with Julio Jones. So I look at Devontae Adams, who admittedly didn't have his best year last year. I believe he had injury troubles last year. I'm not a Packers fan. Um, my roommate is, so I should probably know that. But he still has Aaron Rodgers, one of the greatest to ever do it, throwing him the football. So I, I don't think you can really go wrong with that. And then beyond that, it's it's tough. If I want to go the running back position, I feel like all the top running backs are going to be gone by the time my pick rolls around. And I'm talking Christian McCaffrey, Saquon Barkley, Ezekiel Elliott, uh, Derrick Henry, um, Josh Jacob, even from the Raiders, I think is poised to have a breakout year two. He could be gone. Um, but I, I guess those are my options. Is yeah, Josh Jacobs will probably be there. Alvin Kamara is probably going to be there. Dalvin Cook? How do you feel about Dalvin Cook in Minnesota? I feel good. Like, uh, maybe not a first-round pick. Yeah, not a first-round. All, all these guys feel like reaches in the first round, mm-hmm. which is why I'm struggling. And that's why I'm thinking Mahomes is going to be gone in the first. It's just because yeah. there's there's not much Do you think Lamar Jackson's going before your pick? Do you think you could steal Lamar Jackson? Uh, mm. I don't know if I want Lamar Jackson. You don't know if you want Lamar Jackson. He was the MVP last season, but when you go back and watch that Ravens film, he was the MVP. Be- it wasn't because he was throwing the ball 40 times a game. It was because he had a strong running game, and he was a part of that strong running game, which, good in fantasy. I mean, it's, I got .1 yards per per yard that he gets rushing, so I can deal with that. But I, I don't think I want to go quarterback in the first. It's burned me too many times. Do I go tight end? Do I reach and go Travis Kelsey or George Kittle, one of the two elites? I don't think so. That's that's a big reach, but... I don't think so. And I mean, it's a snake draft, so they'll probably be available back in the second when it comes back around. I don't know. But between those two guys, if I'm looking tight end, you thinking Kittle or you thinking Kelsey? I- I'm thinking uh, Kelsey. I like Kelsey, except for the fact that he plays the Broncos twice a year. So you don't want to root for him. I don't want to root for there, him. That's and, fair. And then I don't want to bench him. That's fair. But Kittle doesn't have the passing game in San Francisco that that uh, Kelsey has in Kansas City. But he is also the number one target in that offense. Which makes things interesting because you don't get that much from the tight end position. So Kittle, maybe I'm leaning Kittle's direction. Besides that, it's, it's going to be a tough year for me. That's what I'm thinking. I, I need to do a lot more preparation. Um, tweet at me. Call the show. We still have one segment left. If you got some fantasy football thoughts, want to hear from you. 402-466-3776. Feel free to let us know before we sign out for the week. It's Hail Varsity Radio presented by the Nebraska Lottery. We'll be wrapping up a Friday after this. Miss us? Come here, brother. Give me a hug. Bring it in for the real thing. We're on call for you. Catch the podcast at HailVarsity.com, the ESPN Lincoln app, or download them on iTunes. Saddle up, partner. Back to Hail Varsity Radio. Wrapping up a Friday here on Hail Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. It's Elijah Herbal and Damon Barr filling in for Chris today. Hope you enjoyed the show. That's all it comes down to. We hope you enjoyed the show. We know that it's it's getting tough, life without sports. And I mean, I hope this show gives you a little bit of a, a little bit of something to to get you through your day just because I know it as much as the next guy. Life without sports has been I expected it to be tough. It's been a little tougher than I expected uh just because it's been so prolonged. Thank God the NBA is coming back. Thank God the NHL is coming back. Okay, the MLB is coming back. Um, hopefully, college football is coming back. Crossing my fingers. NFL, it's it's coming, and we we only got a little bit longer. We're we're almost there, and we'll get some live sports. We'll be all right. That's my that's my pep talk to you uh, to you all out there in Husker Nation tonight. Is we're almost there. We've almost made it through, and uh, I appreciate you making it through this Hail Varsity uh, Radio show with me today. Damon's laughing. I thought that was a pretty good segue. Uh, Before we let you go, got to remind you about our friends over at West Blue Realty. If you're looking to make a move in 2020, you got to give the real estate professionals at West Blue a call today. They specialize in residential home sales in Lincoln and the surrounding communities, and they will help make your next move a smooth one. And if you got agricultural land, they can handle that too. They have an experienced auctioneer and can handle anything from live auctions, sealed bids, and general land listings. They've sold land in Lancaster, Odo, and Seward counties. Within the past year alone, so they can handle a large radius. 
And for a limited time only, if you mention Hail Varsity, West Blue will provide you with up to $1,000 upon the closing of your next home purchase. you got to call Tom Luby or Kelly Hofschneider for more details. you got to ask yourself, whenever you make your next move, you got to ask yourself, what can West Blue Realty do for you? They're located at 1120 K Street, Suite 200, or westbluerealty.com. Remember, it pays to work with West Blue Realty. Damon, before we go today... I got to ask you, it's Friday. You got any big plans for the weekend? Well, I, I have a double birthday party coming up tomorrow, uh, celebrating my cousin's 21st. We're doing one of those uh, those bicycle tours downtown. Oh, those are a good time. So I'm going to uh, get drunk around all of my family members and then immediately Uber back home to uh, celebrate my roommate's 22nd birthday party. So uh, I will talk to you on Monday, and hopefully I won't remember any of it. Hmm. <laughs> Sounds like a, a solid weekend. And let me tell you what, those bike tours ton of fun um because it's bring your own what uh, do you have any advice on what i should bring for sure red solo cups oh of I, course. I think you've seen that in the rules you got to pour everything into red solo right cup. but the nice thing is is you can probably just take a, a six or a tall boys and that, uh-huh. that'll more than handle it okay um, because you get a stop at the bars along the way so well it, we it, might not be doing that just because of you of, know everything yeah. going on yeah I, I understand that uh it's nice some of those bars do have some good deals for you if you're not stopping a, a six or i mean You'll be great. You're just biking around, barely pedaling. <laughs> Pounding them back, right? Pounding them back. That, that should be all you need, especially if you're stopping at bars, um, just because, like, you get some Vegas bombs or whatever. It's great. <laughs> all right. Sounds good. Uh, awesome. I, I definitely, I mean, it's with your family and all. Wear a mask and walk into the bar and, and call it good. I'll get it to go, Cup. I, I, I got to go umpire baseball tomorrow. I, I picked up a uh, an age eight, eight U baseball coming up this weekend it's my uh, it's my first game at that low of an age group this this uh this year so with the weather and the forecast tomorrow i'm not necessarily looking forward to it but as i said earlier you got to do what you got to do for a paycheck um to to a limit i don't want that to be taken out of context that sounds like it'd be taken out of context i'll just wrap it up there hail varsity radio presented by the nebraska lottery back tomorrow morning